So welcome everyone to the next to last crown seminar for the 2023-24 academic year. I'm Nagma Sohrabi and I'm the director for research at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies and the Charles Corky Goodman Professor of History here at Brandeis University. As you all know, because you're here, our seminar today is on an important is an important discussion on a very important book titled How Sanctions Work, Iran and the Impact of Economic Warfare, which is authored by Nagis Bajogli, Valia Nas, Jawad Salehi Esfahani, and Ali Vaez. As I mentioned, this is an incredibly timely book that uses Iran as a case study to ask not whether sanctions work, but how they work. And in answering the question, the book turns on its head conventional wisdom that sanctions are the humane foreign policy tool for changing unwanted state behavior. But rather than me giving you a glowing book review, which I'd happily do if we had time, we're privileged here to have two of the book's writers who for the next 40 minutes or so will be answering my questions about their book and how sanctions work in Iran, after which around 1145, we will turn to the audience's questions and that will take about half an hour. You are welcome to ask your questions by typing them into the Q&A section of your Zoom screen. I also encourage you to keep an eye on the chat function um, where throughout the hour and 15 minutes, our assistant director, Karen Spira, will be, will be providing links relevant to the information that is being given to you throughout the seminar. Also a reminder that this seminar is recorded and it will be made available on the Crown Center YouTube channel soon after. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nagis Bojobli and Valia Nast to the Crown Center. Um, I think for even casual watchers of Iran, um, these two scholars don't need any introductions, but that's not going to stop me from giving them to you anyway. Nagis Bojobli is an award-winning anthropologist and filmmaker, and she's currently an assistant professor of Middle East Studies at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Her book, Iran Reframed, Anxieties of Power in the Islamic Republic, received the 2020 Margaret Mead Award, the 2020 Choice Award for Outstanding Academic Title, and the 2021 Silver Medal in Independent Publishers Book Awards. And from my perspective, it's truly one of the most important books that's been published about Iran in recent years. And I will say my students actually really love reading and discussing the book. Valia Nast is the Majid Khadouri Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies at Johns Hopkins SAIS also, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. Um, he served as the Dean of the school in which he's at, and from 2009 to 2011, he was a senior advisor to US Special Representative for Afghan Af Afghanistan and Pakistan to Ambassador Richard Holbrook. He is also the author of many books, um, all of which I'm not going to mention, but two of them are The Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy in Retreat, and The Shia Revival, How Conflicts Within Islam Will Shape the Future. And these were books that um, at least are very, very important to my thinking about the Middle East, and I think many others also. Both Nagis and Vali also publish in venues such as The New York Times and Foreign Affairs, and they are also co-directors of the Johns Hopkins um, SAIS Rethinking Iran Initiative, and we have a link um, in the chat if you wanted to check out this very interesting, very important initiative. On that note, welcome Nagis and Veli, and thank you so much for being with us. All right, um, before we start digging into the content um, and the nitty gritty of the argument that you're making, I was, when I was reading the book, I was really intrigued by the fact that the four of you who are co-authors are anthropologists, political scientists, economists, and po policymakers, and that the book seems to draw on multiple methods, including interviews and a very deep bench of social scientists and people who are in Iran and on the ground and are experiencing these sanctions. So could you speak a bit about how you and your co-authors came to write this book, why you wrote it? Okay, I'll start us off. Thanks so much for having us, Nagma, and the whole team at Brandeis for putting on this event. And we look forward to the conversation today. Um, so in answer to that question, 
We started this research through uh, the size Rethinking Iran initiative in 2019 when Iran came under this um, maximum pressure sanctions by the Trump administration. And we recruited over a dozen um, economists and social scientists with lots of experience um, doing long-term research in Iran. They all pr produced original research about the impacts of sanctions from a variety of different perspectives and a variety of different ways. And one of the reasons we decided to first bring them to the table was because um, sanctions oftentimes have been studied from the point of view of policy implementation or through sort of um, an international relations focus, but from the perspective of the state that is putting the sanctions on. And besides some research that's been done on public health sectors, for example, in Cuba or some other places that have been sanctioned, we don't really have a comprehensive look at, um, at what sanctions do to a targeted society. After those research projects were done, the four of us who wrote this book decided that we needed to help, you know, further along this conversation and provide a a, a single narrative. Uh, but doing so really required us to come at it again from various angles because how sanctions work is not just one way, especially when they're put on a country like Iran over many, many decades. So there is lots of ways in which not only do sanctions work on the economy, but in, in different ways on social and political realms and the cultural realms. Um, and so the four of us came together. And, and as you said, we have very different styles of both doing research and writing. And so a lot of it really came to how we were going to construct this narrative to, first of all, not read like an edited volume, but to really read like a singular narrative and take the, the reader through um, and have them understand sanctions. But the other really big important part and key to us was to take the discussion of sanctions from something that is very abstract and bring it down to the human level and really bring the reader into seeing how sanctions are not just something that you know, the regulations come out and it is supposed to have some kind of effects, but it really has an impact on the everyday lives of people. And then therefore it impacts people differently depending on what where they are in society, what kind of social positions they have, um, when the sanctions started and sort of what happens throughout. So th this was the, one of the ways in which we we came to it and I'll pass it, pass it over to Badi. Well, uh, first of all, let me thank Narme also and everybody at Crown Center and Brandeis for inviting us and putting this event together. Uh, it's wonderful being here with you. Uh, um, just to add to um, um, Nargis's points, and uh, you know, it, it, we we hear so much about use of sanctions, not only with Iran. I mean, it basically, the word sanctions has become the go-to, if you would, answer to every problem that Iran poses uh, to its own people, to the United States. Whether we're talking about uh, the opponents of the Islamic Republic uh, among Iranians themselves or foreign policy makers. But we're also seeing sanctions become really the tool of choice for the United States uh, uh, across the board. So if uh, uh, the, the Russian dissident Alexei Navalny uh, dies in prison in Siberia, immediately U.S.'s answer is to put 500 more sanctions on the U.S. But what we have found uh, it was that this policy policy conversation is completely divorced in, from what we in the social sciences like to think in terms of you know, grounding in actual facts. And so this book and the way we wrote it and, and the people that collaborated was a deliberate attempt to, to bridge social science learning with policymaking, right? And, and actually to take this conversation of sanctions to the next level. Why are sanctions uh, levied? Who does it benefit? Uh, 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 which is a big question. Does it benefit the, the, the country that imposes it? Uh, uh, does it uh, uh, benefit uh, intermediaries? Does it benefit anybody in the country that uh, it is imposed on? And also to really look at do they work, which is, I think, the most fundamental question, and to, and to separate uh, you know, the idea that, yes, of course, economic pain works, but does it work in the way it was intended? And uh, uh, not only that, but what we found in the book is actually, in many ways, it's counterproductive. Uh, and I and to bring all of these to the fore, because I think as uh, both with respect to Iran and the broader use of sanctions, it's time uh, for a much more serious debate. And and Iran, as as Nargis said, is the country with the amount of data and and the, and the longitudinal sort of uh, uh, history there that really lends itself to to doing a deep dive on into sanctions. 
Great. So let's just pick up actually what from what Valley said. You know, you said there's just so much data on Iran, and the way you guys present this in one sentence is, of course, that it's the most sanctioned country in the world. So can you give us, before we talk about its effect, give us a sense of what that means in terms of the history that you just mentioned, Vali, um, but also, and also numerically, just some kind of data, um, and also just give us a, a sense of how much it sanctions in comparison to other countries, maybe even Russia, since you mentioned it. You know, the, the, we have a whole chapter in the book about the way in which sanctions have, have been implemented and levied and increased over time. And they come in waves in Iran. I mean, uh, really starting from the hostage crisis in 1979, 80 to today. And then they really reach a, a sort of an apex with the maximum pressure, which is literally every possible sanction has been uh, levied against Iran. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 both in terms of length of time and, and scale of the sanctions, at least until Russia was put under sanctions, there's no doubt that Iran was and maybe by some measure still is the most sanctioned country in the world. It's the one that is it's financially in terms of exports, in terms of trade, in terms of all kinds of industries, in terms of interaction of people, etc., has been sanctioned. Now, you know, Nargis uh, can speak to this. There, there is a social human level at which this, this has impacted Iran. And then there is a political level, uh, a foreign policy level that, that it has impacted Iran. And then we do also think that it's impacted the United States' ability to deal with, with, with Iran in, in ways that uh, uh, we haven't thought about it. But one, one issue that came very clearly through the book uh, as we did this research and as we wrote it, is that we often think about sanctions as uh, the way in which to influence the behavior of a country, right? I mean, the best the best sort of benign way of thinking about it is that we want to change Iran's behavior, Iran's policies. Now, whether it's on human rights or it's on the nuclear issue, and in the war, and in the more uh, sort of aggressive cases, that we want to change its regime, right? But what we found in reality is that sanctions are a very powerful tool of state building. In other words, they chisel the country uh, into what it becomes, right? In other words, in the case of Iran, they have not changed the regime. They have not changed Iran's behavior in any positive way, but they have really shaped the Islamic Republic, its society, its government uh, in, in very fundamental ways. And, uh, and Nargis can speak to this, how it's changed the economy, how it's changed uh, you know, the nature of the politics, how it's changed Iranian societies. We think in ways that, are, that, that we cannot go back. In you know, other words, there's no snapback easily once the sanctions are lifted. So as social scientists, we ought to think about sanctions really as state building mechanisms as opposed to foreign policy behavior mechanism, because there they have had zero impact. Zero positive impact, in our opinion. If you looked at Iran today, it's more dangerous, more nuclear, more hardline, more harsh with its own people. So they haven't worked. But everything I said is also the nature of the Iranian state and society has been permanently changed. Nagus, do you want to pick that up in terms of talking about specifically taking what Betty said about sanctions as state building? First of all, can you talk to us about what that actually means on in Iran? What what has it done? How has it shaped both state and I know you talk about society also, but also can you also give us a sense of how sanctions are talked about in Iran? So in conjunction with how it's um, shaping the state. Sure. So first off, I would say you know when we were writing this and going through the research for this, oftentimes the question that is asked is, "Do sanctions work?" And though that's a very valid question, especially when one is looking at policy from a social scientific sort of lens, of course sanctions work. They do work, right? Like they they may not get to an intended policy outcome, but they 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 make social waves. They make political waves. And so what what we wanted to do was we wanted to trace that out and figure out what is the work that they're doing. Sort of at a broad level, what we found is that sanctions, um, as they increase, they because it is deemed as economic warfare, both by the targeted society, but also really key to this, because another component to this research was we did a lot of discourse analysis of uh, sanctions policymakers themselves. So within the US end or within the European end, we were really focused much more on US sanctions on Iran. So that's what we, we, we honed in on the most. 
So both from the perspective of U.S. policymakers who work on sanctions and the perspective of those who are uh, targeted states, sanctions are seen as being a kind of warfare. So then therefore the states respond as if they are in war with an outside country. So what that does, just like any other kind of warfare, is that it begins to politically harden the political culture of the targeted state, which we begin to see increasingly, especially through maximum pressure sanctions on Iran. It uh, decreases the, both the living standards of those in the middle classes and lower middle classes, and definitely those who are already in the in poor classes. We have a huge increase in the level of poverty in Iran under maximum pressure sanctions. So that is creating new kinds of social bonds in a society. When you have a uh, standard of living goes down so drastically over a short period of time, especially under maximum pressure, that creates new social classes, that creates new kinds of social bonds. And we trace those out in the book. Um, and then importantly, because the uh, Islamic Republic uh, under maximum pressure sanctions is under a form of shadow war with the United States, meaning that it's not just economic sanctions that are that are taking place, but there's covert actions, there's cyber warfare, there are psyops, there are media wars happening across these borders within the region, specifically tied to Iran, and the Islamic Republic is responding to those in kind as well. Um, by engaging in, in shadow warfare, shadow warfare is first and foremost an intelligence form of warfare. So therefore, what we found very specifically in the case of Iran is that the um, intel apparatus tied to the Revolutionary Guard and especially its boats forces, which are its territorial forces, that outlook comes to take over the outlook of the entire political establishment, which is why we have in the past couple of years the types of hardliners that have come into power in Iran are directly tied to the increase in sanctions in the country and the increase of this sense of being in a battlefield mentality when it comes to Iran's geopolitics. So on an internal level, not only does politics move towards a more hardline stance, but those who are uh, social activists, members of civil society, they come under increased threat and increased sort of surveillance and securitization. Um, another important thing, and you, you know, you asked how how are sanctions discussed within Iran. So one of the chain, one of the differences we see, um, because in writing this book, we also took very serious look at different differently sanctioned countries around the world as well. Um, one of the differences we see in Iran is that unlike, for example, a place like Cuba or Venezuela, in which the political establishment blames the sanctions almost exclusively on the United States. And that becomes the rhetoric of the state, which is that we are under economic threat because of the US. In Iran, you don't have the same kind of one party establishment that you have in some of these other spaces. So actually those who were at the forefront of asking for and pushing for diplomacy and engagement with the West, which tended to be the reformists and the pragmatists in Iran, after Trump pulls out of the JCPOA and Im imposes maximum pressure sanctions, the hardline elements come in and say, see, we told you that you cannot trust the United States. And so they essentially push out that entire uh, political force from within the country that had to fight for many years to create a discursive space to even be able to engage with the West in diplomacy, right? Because Iran, Iran's politics is not one that is just what the Supreme Leader says and happens. There's a lot of factionalism that happens there. So the factions that wanted diplomacy with the West had to create that space with maximum pressure, that space gets completely shut down, and then the hardliners have their ability to take over and then to really put at the forefront, not only should we not engage with the West, but the West is out to existentially remove us from power, and therefore the politics that we need to have to stay in power is one that is of complete forms of, of confrontation. Um, I want to come back to some of the points you made, but I do want to use this as an opportunity to ask Vali, then what about this argument that it was sanctions that brought Iranians to the table for the JCPOA? It's a very prevalent argument. Everybody makes it. It's almost like accepted wisdom. But it seems like if that Nagus's analysis actually questions that conventional wisdom, or do you not agree? No, I, I, I think... Uh, um, uh... She's correct, but 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 when we put in the title how how sanctions work, uh, 
it's not only how sanctions work in Iran. It's also how sanctions work in the United States. So uh, first of all, I would say uh, the, 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 the fact that Iran came to the table can be read two ways. One is that Iran, under, Iran came to the table essentially to have sanctions lifted, right? There was no other reason why they came to the table. America wanted Iran's nuclear program stopped. Iran wanted sanctions lifted. Iran had already concluded that the only way in which it could negotiate with the United States was to have a much, much, much bigger uh, uh, nuclear program. So, you know, they, they did negotiate with Europeans in 2006. They had only 119 centrifuges and the U United States dismissed the deal. So they built 119,000 centrifuges and then the U.S. negotiated. So in a way, the U.S. sanctions also encouraged Iran to become to, to build something much more threatening in order to negotiate. Right. So you could argue that U.S. sanctions had already encouraged Iran to build a bigger program. The po second point is that if in 2013, even the supreme leader of Iran uh, argued that, OK, the sanctions are really bad, maybe we can negotiate to lift them. Once Trump came out of the deal and even before Trump came out of the deal, not much sanctions was lifted. Right. In reality, that's a that's a learning moment. That's part of how sanctions work. So the Iranians learned something, which is uh, sanctions don't get lifted as quickly as you expect, and they can be reimposed. So that's part of how sanctions work. And I think one very, very important thing, which other countries are also learning, whether it's Russia, Venezuela, is that sanctions is not like war. It's not like shooting, where you can have a ceasefire. Both sides stop shooting. Like... Uh, if you don't shoot here, we don't shoot there. Uh, the, the, uh, the, with sanctions, one country stops doing what it does. And in fact, in the case of Iran, they dismantled what they had agreed to under JCPOA within six months. But US sanctions didn't come off at that same pace. And then they came back. So the, 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 our, the understanding in Iran after 2015 is that sanctions will never come off, not, not in the way you expect, right? Uh, you know, there's Congress. Congress can put its own sanctions. You know, as part of uh, the whole sanctions regime, you have to turn Iran into a, a sort of a vilified country. Which American president, which American politicians wants to stand up there and say, I'm giving Iran money, I'm lifting sanctions on Iran. And, and so the calculation changed, right? So if it worked in 2013 that more sanctions brought Iran to the table, and Iran agreed to a deal that it would implement very quickly in six months, that's no longer the case. I mean, Iran now uh, uh, won't go to the table before it has 60%, 80% enrichment, and they're not likely to implement it as fast because they've learned how sanctions work. And how sanctions work in America is that they're sticky, right? It's very easy to implement them and almost impossible to remove them because they become politicized in a way that uh, the American political system is almost um, is almost um, paralyzed to lift them in, a, in an effective way. And in Iran, for instance, they continuously give the example of Serbia now, which, uh, which is even after Milosevic fell, even after Serbia became democratic, the United States was reluctant or couldn't lift all the sanctions that it imposed because Milosevic was there. So, so, you know, countries begin to shape their policies around this reality. And then Trump also proved that you could, you know, you, you can dismantle a whole plutonium plant in Iraq that costs billions of dollars and years to build. Uh, uh, and it's going to be very hard to rebuild it. But Trump can basically reimpose sanctions with an executive order within a week. And so you, you're not dealing in equal items. And so Iran's the whole experience with sanctions, especially after the maximum pressure, has changed Iran in ways that it's not the same thing as it was in 2013. So the logic to say just increase sanctions on them and they'll crawl on their knees is not going to work. As we're seeing, Iran has been under maximum pressure sanctions far more than Obama put on Iran in 2011 to 2013. But Iran is not budging. So so. And that's why looking at longitudinal history matters, right? Because you cannot look at these things as just one, uh, you know, clip of a fill, uh, of a photo in a in a film, right? Yes, that logic may have applied in 2013. It no longer applies because of the way the sanctions worked in the United States.
I mean, I that that's great. But it, it, and I want to pick up on on that part of what Valley said for um. Now I guess going back to the domestic scene um about not, there not being really a snapback when it comes whether in terms of foreign policy and you said it also um I guess or domestic scene. But in, in addition to changing the securitization outlook, let's put it that way, of Iran's security forces, you mentioned and talk about in the book that it created, you mentioned new social classes and social bonds, which I think about in the same way that Valley was talking about foreign policy, that there's no changing it once it's been formed, really, except in the long term. But I, I wanted to, if you could, for us, just explain what these social bonds and new social classes are, maybe an example or two, and how they're actually impacting the domestic scene in Iran, which then affects the foreign policy scene vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States. Sure. So I'll answer this by saying by in, in two ways. One is the way in which it's impacted and created new social classes and bonds in the ruling establishment and the other sort of on the ground for those not tied to the ruling establishment. So when sanctions are imposed on a country like Iran, Russia, Cuba, any of these kind of states, the governments are not going to put their hands up and say, OK, you know, how can we get back into your good graces, United States or the West, because their entire political culture is defined by not being bullied by the United States or the West, right? And so pretty automatically what they begin to do is that they begin to figure out ways to bust through sanctions. And busting through sanctions essentially is figuring out ways to um, do trade with the, with the existence of sanctions there. Now, how do you do that? When you are uh, under the kinds of sanctions that Iran has been under for the past many decades, um, doing trade becomes illegal in many ways. And if you are caught doing it, it has, uh, you, you can be persecuted in, in many different ways, right? And so it's a, it's a very expensive endeavor and it is one that carries with it sort of different kinds of potential criminal charges. Um, in addition to that, anything that you want to procure on the international market, the price of it all of a sudden goes much higher than if you were going to be trading without sanctions. So you need to have a lot of capital at disposal, at your disposal to be able to do this, as well as the, the backing of institutions to allow for you to, to trade essentially on the black market. The only forces after time that are able to keep up that level of trade are those that are tied to the Revolutionary Guard because they, they are the ones who control the borders and the ports of entry, as well as those tied to um, the political elite within the country because they have the capital to engage in this kind of trade. Now, when you engage in black market trade at the levels that you need to in order to keep an economy going, there's a lot of kickback. There's a lot of corruption that ends up happening. We see this, this the exact same things that happened in Iraq in the 1990s under the UN trade, um, or sorry, under the UN sanctions. Um, so when you have so much trade happening on the black market and corruption levels begin to go high, you have a lot of cash that begins to flow into the economy that needs to be washed. So first of all, a lot of that cash that is flowing into the economy that is from hands of those who are involved within the businesses tied to the IRGC or the political establishment, that means that their wealth is increasing exponentially. I mean, if you just look in Tehran in the past uh, three to four years, there are luxury buildings going up left and right all throughout the city. There are luxury cars spread out all throughout the major urban centers of Iran. This is in part due to the repercussions of that kind of trade on the black market. Now, that's not trickling down to everyone in society, right? This is part of what sanctions do is it creates a new wealth owning class that is tied to the political and more importantly, the, the military apparatus of the society. And this is something we see in every single heavily sanctioned country around the world. Um, now, in order to wash that money, you need you begin to invest in areas where that can happen. And just like those who might know the history of the making of music industry, for example, in the United States, that that happens through the mob, right through the mafia and its need to wash money. So in Iran, what, what's happened is that that money is now going into the film sector, into the music sector, into the television sector. And that has long term effects, too, because now um, in order to make 
films, you, it is now the logic of making films in Iran has shifted from what it used to be an art house cinema to moving much more towards like a, a profit uh, and studio model where the money of that is, is in the hands of businesses tied to the IRGC. So the entire sort of cultural sector begins to shift over time. Now on the societal level, what happens is that folks do not have easy access to goods as, as, as much as before. Now, because of the size of Iran's economy, you don't have the shortages that you have in some of these other sanctioned countries. Um, there have been some positives from a lot of the interviews that I did, especially among younger women, um, because they no longer have to, to compete with foreign goods. And so what you have happening in a space like Iran, but also in other sanctioned countries, is you begin to have an autarkic uh, economic system that develops, whereby you have a lot of small micro businesses run by a lot of younger folks, especially who are utilizing things like Instagram and WhatsApp to be able to, um, to trade, to sell their goods. So you do have a rise in micro businesses um, that uh, are able to rise because they're no longer having to compete as much with with foreign brands, for example. We see this very much in the fashion industry in Iran and the um, sort of the, the things tied to the entertainment sectors. Um, so that is one way in which it has folks talked about it as being positive for them. Um, but then what it does is it makes your food basket also get smaller and smaller and your ability to access goods get harder and harder. So that has hit particularly hard um, uh, households that are run exclusively by women. And uh, and uh, it has turned a lot of workers in Iran into day laborers and, and folks who are reliant on day to day wages. So it's had this is what this is what we mean by saying it's creating new social bonds. Do you want to add or? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, uh, just to bring it one level higher, what, what Nargis is describing also applies, for instance, to industry. In other words, once, uh, uh, if, let's say, manufacturing in Iran begins to be tied to Chinese suppliers as opposed to European suppliers, once it begins to get locked in a particular uh, supply chain that is reliant on revolutionary guards, then uh, you know it's not that will not easily be changed. Uh, it, it, the longer sanctions stay, the more uh, everything that Nargis was describing gets baked in, if if you would, into Iranian state and and society. So by the time, like now, since maximum pressure started, we're now uh, about five six years away from that. So is a whole financial network in Iran, a whole supply chain for industry, a whole a trade mechanism, et cetera, has been created that now essentially Iranian business, even, even those who are independent are now sort of now tied to this. Uh, in fact, there was a lack of enthusiasm about the Vienna talks among many in the business sector because they said that, you know, this yo-yo of sanctions being lifted, being put back is more damaging to Iran. And we now got used to, uh, you know, doing business on our own way. And then finally, bringing it even one layer f further up is that, uh, and, you know, you could see countries like China and Russia are now looking to Iran. Iran sort of has perfected as a country, and I don't mean just as a business sector, as a country, it has almost perfected the business and technology of going around sanctions through a mix of autarky, uh, you know, buying things around the world, et cetera, so that they, you know, they can produce advanced, uh, you know, missiles or uh, advanced um, uh, drones as well as sustain their uh, manufacturing. And once a country as a whole basically makes massive investment in this sort of alternative mode of economic development, as, as flawed as it is, uh, its entire political economy and state structures begin to be sort of woven around it. And so that's why these arguments about, you know, let's put sanctions and Iran's going to change its behavior, or if we put a lot of sanctions, the regime is going to fall, basically does not account for the ways in which Iran has profoundly changed under sanctions and why there is resilience, if you would. What if there, I want to come at, some, at at the end to the counter arguments, to the arguments that you guys are making, um, but, but you made me think about what, you both mentioned maximum pressure a lot, and I would add COVID also as a doubling factor. 
And yet both of you are talking about these sanctions being long, long, they have a long history. We all know they start very quickly after the revolution. To what degree are you talking about sanctions when it comes to Iran? And to what degree are we talking about these, I want to not say exceptional, but you know, between maximum pressure and COVID, that the situation that you guys are analyzing came out of that and not necessarily the long history of sanctions in and of itself. So let me let me just give a quick, quick answer to that. Uh, Nargis probably knows more. Actually, it's very interesting why Iran after China was the very first country to be hit by COVID to such an extent. That was because of the extensive amount of uh, uh, industrial relations between Iran and China. I mean, you know, in fact, particularly the city of Wuhan is, is fairly well connected for varieties of reasons to Qom, for instance. And, and also the building of a railway by where Chinese workers, engineers, et cetera. So, so that itself was what it made, interestingly made Iran the first country after China to have an explosion of COVID in it. But I actually think, yes, it, like many other countries, Iran was also impacted greatly economically uh, by, um, by COVID. But ironically, given as a highly sanctioned country, it performed a lot better uh, because of exactly that kind of autarky that that Nargis is is mentioning, because of uh, it, it, it its its ability to sort of um, manage its healthcare industry uh, in a particular way. I mean, at the beginning, everybody railed against Iran, but in in a way, Iran managed COVID uh, in terms of healthcare better than the United States did at, at that point in time. Uh, so I I would say uh, you know uh, COVID was an added. But COVID was an added to economic problems in Egypt, in Pakistan, in India, across the developing world. But why isn't it that COVID actually break break the back of the Islamic Republic? Largely, I think, is because of the way they had they had built, if you would, this kind of a resilient economy uh, that that allowed them to to, to continue on. Um, yes, I would say it's difficult to say absolutely what is COVID and what is what is sanctions. But, but the patterns of economic relationship that that Nargis is describing these were not born of COVID. These were born of sanctions, and maybe they helped basically uh, Iran manage manage COVID uh, in a way that uh, we didn't expect. Yeah, and the other thing that I would just add to that is, as social scientists, we can never study anything in a vacuum, right? It's just every. The, the, whatever social phenomenon is happening is creating certain kinds of waves in society. And so one of the things when we really grappled with when we were beginning this research is to think very much about how can we map on the effects of sanctions on everything else that's happening in Iranian society, right? And um, and part of what we were doing is because many of us have been studying and working on Iran for many years, and then especially, uh, you know, being able to have access to a lot of folks in Iran and having those relationships over long, you know, over a, a decade to two decades of time, we're able to put this research in the broader sort of map and trajectory of everything else that we've been doing. And then we can map on and see the spikes of both maximum pressure or different forms. Actually, the Obama era sanctions ended up producing the sort of first wave of new kinds of social bonds that we begin to see that then get picked up again during maximum pressure, that then COVID sort of adds on another layer to it. So our attempt in this book is not to isolate sanctions, but it's actually to show how it's weaving itself in to the everyday lives of people alongside other kinds of social phenomenon that are happening. Um, otherwise, I don't think that there's a really honest way to study sanctions as a social scientist by attempting to just isolate it because part of the problem or part of the issue of sanctions is that it is not meant to be isolated, right? It, it works alongside every other kind of factor that is happening in society. Um, and the other thing I would say is just as Vadi mentioned before, um, just like Russia and other countries are now, or Russian businessmen and policymakers are traveling to Iran to learn how you, how you build an economy that resists US sanctions, 
Iranians undertook that as well um, when they first started to come under severe sanctions. And actually, in the research that we did leading up to this book, I was following around uh, Iranian businessmen tied to the IRGC when they were traveling to Latin America. And part of what they were attempting to do actually was looking at the pharmaceutical sector in Cuba, for example, um, and how it was able to develop a, pharma a strong pharmaceutical sector in the face of heavy U.S. sanctions, which then ended up helping Iran under COVID um, uh, eventually once they sort of got their feet under them. So, you know, again, there's a whole technology or, or knowledge production around how you bust sanctions that becomes another form of a social reality the more and more sanctions are implemented. So since the start of the 21st century, only 24 years ago, U.S. sanctions have increased 900 percent around the world. That creates its own kinds of social realities. And what that does is, again, these countries are not just sitting there and saying, OK, you know, we're going to have to take this from the U.S. No, they're trying to figure out how can they keep their countries going and how they do that as they learn from one another. Um, and, and that creates its own forms of networks, as Vadi was saying. Um, and those networks create, create new realities that we have to deal with and contend with and understand. Um. I, I, I want to invite um, people in the audience, our participants, to put their questions um, in the Q&A, but I still have, I think, two more baby questions. Um, I'm going to put on my skeptical hat, or maybe not so much skeptical, but really thinking um, about the implications of what you have written in the book and have just laid out when it comes to actually having a plan to deal, let's just say Iran for now, but we can also think about Russia vis-a-vis -vis, um what's going on in, in the Ukrainian war, in the sense that, as far as I understand, right, there are three options we have if we want to create um, behavior change in another state, as in talk about the U.S., which is the military option, right, diplomacy, and then sanctions. Now, diplomacy needs two willing sides to take part. So we don't really have control over whether the other side wants to come and talk to us or not. That it, so if I take what you all you both are saying to heart, that means I'm taking sanctions also off the table as an alternative. So does that actually just leave me with a military option, or are there other suggestions or ways of thinking about it that you want to replace um, with take sanctions off and replace it with it? I may, may start on this. Uh, you know, the, the question for us was not to say sanctions are an absolute good, good or an absolute evil. Sanctions are obviously implemented uh, in, in a particular way. So the reality of sanctions is is uh, is about the way in which it's 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 implemented. So uh, uh, you're absolutely right that sanctions are being used as an alternative to war and uh, as an uh, either uh, either to encourage diplomacy or as an alternative to to diplomacy. But as I said, the problematic is that it will only work if the other side calculates that if it changes its behavior, that sanctions would go away. If it comes to an understanding that once you get under sanctions, you're not really going to get off of it, uh, then uh, then the sanctions are basically are not going to bring them to the table. And as in the case of Iraq, may end up being actually a prelude to war. Now, in the case of Iran, I think there's something added, the, 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 and you could see it also maybe at some stages with Russia as well. So what is the purpose of sanctions in the U.S. In the US view? Is it to make the United States uh, feel self-satisfied with its own population, pretend it's doing something uh, while it doesn't really want to do anything? So you put 500 sanction, meaningless sanctions on people who have no business outside of Russia, Right. Or, you know, you sanction Iran's foreign minister who actually negotiated a nuclear deal. Well, how is that going to change Iran's behavior? It just sounds good. Right. Uh, or are you using sanctions to punish? In other words, it's purely punitive. Are you using sanctions to deter? You know, as you put certain sanctions so that the country doesn't do anything or you put sanctions to actually uh, uh, change the regime entirely. Right. And in the case of uh, the United States sanctions with Iran, it's not clear what the intent is, right? Even when maximum pressure was put, President Trump seemed to be suggesting that this is to bring Iran to the table, whereas the Secretary of State was suggesting almost that they're after regime change. 
And many people who support sanctions on Iran are under the impression that they would lead to regime change. So, you know, I, I would say if sanctions are going to do what you're saying, I mean, that's part of the arg uh, you know, argument of the re policy relevance of this book, the way in which they are implemented in the United States, and particularly ways in which the president of the United States should be able to lift them, uh, uh, unless you change those ways, uh, sanctions are not going to have the effect that you want. So you have to be able to tell Putin that if you actually left uh, left uh, Ukraine, these sanctions will definitely come off and stay off. If you can't say that, you cannot basically persuade him uh, uh, to change his behavior because you put sanctions on. Uh, and, and so so I think it, it it's really the book is a call also for ways in which san uh, sanctions as a tool have to be used differently if they are to be effective. But what about, I mean, and I, guess I want to hear from you, but I would add to giving you the harder part. <laughs> um, what about sanctions as a moral stance? I mean, I know, I, I think that's important, right? Like, look, for example, when 2022 and the um, Massa Amini protests were happening, one of the arguments that people were making outside of Iran, the opposition, was that, okay, yes, there's harm being done, but, you know, sometimes to take a moral stance towards something of greater evil, right? You have to also have some kind of harming, you know, other people. I, I just mean to say like, there's a sense of a gradation of morality here often. And so in addition to answering the early question, can you also address the question of what, what if we say sanctions are a moral stance towards it, yeah. immoral there, behavior? No, I, I mean, look, there is definitely moral hazard in applying sanctions because, you know, first of all, it's just like with war. Uh, it, it's 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 perfectly fine for people who are sitting in the safety of their homes to 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 sort of say we should we should drop bombs on Iraqis because the regime is bad, uh, or on Vietnamese. Uh, it's it's there is a moral hazard. So people who are living in the West. They, they're not sacrificing to remove the Islamic Republic to basically make a decision for an average Iranian that they should suffer because their government is bad. And, they, and let's not forget, sanctions, we, we think we're levying it on country, but we essentially are levying it on people. We are basically telling people that you have an awful authoritarian, unresponsive government, but I'm going to use you as a battering rod. Uh, to bring that edifice down. I'm going to put my uh, uh, knee on your neck until you start uh, rebelling against your government, right? And there is a there is a big moral question here. Uh, I, I think the only one of the problems with 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 sanctions is that uh, those who impose it, people in countries that impose it or those who support it, don't quite think in these terms. Right, they they think in abstract terms that we're sanctioning the Islamic Republic, right? But you're not. You're 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 in effect are denying food, medicine, jobs, etc., to large numbers of Iranians. You're condemning them to fall from middle class status to to lower class status, uh, and and so yes, like like any like shooting bullets or dropping bombs, there is a moral hazard here, which we also ought to debate, but. Nargis has done a lot more work on, on actually what it means for uh, everyday Iranians. Well, you know, I would say that one of the things that we argue, especially in the conclusion, is that we really have to take seriously the fact that sanctions are a moral question about collective punishment of the population, just like Badi finished saying. Um, in addition to that, though, getting to your question, Nahmed, about, for example, the uprisings last year and... Um, whether those outside of the country, within the Iranian diaspora, wherever they may have been, who kept pushing for more sanctions. Um, there's a couple of things to consider here. One, in tandem with that kind of conversation, we kept, I kept hearing, especially in Washington and policy circles, that, okay, well, you know, we want to be able to, to support the, the, the protesters. We want to be able to support folks who want to go on strike. How can we get funding into the country? And these were U.S. policymakers who were trying to figure this out, but because of the sanctions, they actually had no route to get funding to the country. They had no route to get 
um, folks who were attempting to actually upend the system there to be able to do so. So there is something here that we also have to consider, which is, for example, not my, I know you know this very well, but for those in the audience, the way in which the revolution in 79 comes about is because you're able to have large sectors of workers go on strike for prolonged periods of time. You cannot have that under systems that are so heavily sanctioned like this because people literally do not have money to make it to the end of the week, let alone to be able to think about striking for months on end to cripple an economy or to cripple a state and, and coming to, to force to terms with it. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is that um, within the Iranian context specifically, but I think you can start to apply this to bigger and bigger economies like the Russian one, um, is one of the things that we argue, you know, Woodrow Wilson said himself, and this I'm going to quote from him, but he said, apply this economic, peaceful, silent, deadly remedy, and there will be no need for force. It does not cost a life outside of the nation boycott it, but it brings a pressure upon the nation, which in my judgment, no modern nation could resist. Now, of course, we see that that, that hasn't panned out in, in the ways that Woodrow Wilson thought after World War I. And in one of the arguments that we're making in the book is that actually not only are sanctions not a, a a, an alternative to war, but they can very well become a cause of war. And the ways in which we see how Iran has developed its foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis sanctions is that it has gone from creating an access around it to be a defense against any kind of potential attack by the United States to as maximum pressure sanctions were put on it, it turns that access into an offensive force. And so now you actually have a uh, a hot shadow war happening across the region, which is not only on the Iran end, but also all of the other members of this so-called axis of resistance that are allied with Iran are also heavily sanctioned. So sanctions in this case is not an alternative to war, but is becoming a cause of war. And, and we have to, and then the other thing that I would say to that is those kinds of sanctions did not prevent Russia and Putin from invading Ukraine and starting another war, right? So it's it, it no longer becomes a deterrent uh, factor by any means, and it becomes one in which uh, targeted states begin to push back on pretty forcefully. I have so much follow-up, but I'm gonna. I ha we're gonna shift um, to the questions that are being asked of you. Um, I I want to start with a question that Professor Abrahamian um, is asking about when and why did embargoes turn into sanctions? And he mentions that in the 1930s to 50s, major powers imposed embargoes. So is there a legal difference, or what is the difference basically between these two? I guess you want to. Sure. Um, so yeah, there all of when sanctions began to be developed after in the interwar period, they were developed very much in order to, as I said before, with in relation to the to the quote with on Woodrow Wilson, as an ability to to make some kind of or punish rogue states instead of sending troops. Right? They were looking at the carnage around them. One of the things that they did begin or that has been a part of sort of foreign policy more generally has been embargoes. But as the moral question started to become more a part of creating this post-war uh, international order, it moved from embargoes to putting on different kinds of regulations for economic sanctions to make them more moral. Now, if you look at it from the perspective of Cuba, for example, even though there are you know, all of these ways in which it's not supposed to be thought of as an embargo or as a blockade, very much both within the Cuban establishment itself, as well as at the UN, they are talked about as a blockade of the Cuban islands nation. Um, this, in the way that I an analyze this, is that this is a, a question of semantics and a question of discourse and a question of attempting to make these tools seem and become more moral. Um, Whereas I think if you dig in, you begin to see that uh, even, for example, one of the we're starting new research projects in our initiative at Rethinking Iran at SAIS, which is looking at differently sanctioned countries around the world. So a country, for example, like South Sudan that is under targeted sanctions, scholars who are working on, on that case, um, who are scholars of South Sudan, are showing actually that targeted sanctions, which are meant to be different than broad-based 
uh, sanctions like on, on the Iranian economy actually in in practice end up functioning exactly the same as broad-based sanctions. So again, this comes, Professor Abrahamian's question is a great one. And the I think one thing that we have to understand in it is that the categorization of how we talk about these different kinds of tools, what is, what is that categorization doing in and of itself? Is that discourse one that is attempting to illuminate what is happening or one that's actually attempting to hide um, and and put on new words, kind of like, you know, are we gonna, smart bombs versus carpet bombing versus this is sort of the same way that I, I think about and analyze sanctions um, when you look at it in practice. Pali, do you want to add? No, no, I think Nargis covered it. Great. Um, we have another question that goes, it's methodology, but it's actually asking you to um, expand further on your thinking, which is that, the question is, when dealing with data, how do you both, all of you writers, consider the enforcement slash non-enforcement of sanctions when conducting your research? Did you evaluate the difference between imposition and enforcement in coming to the conclusions that you reach? I mean, uh, you know, we, we obviously have, uh, 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 and I encourage those who want to uh, learn more about this, they can, can look at the papers that the social scientists uh, wrote about uh, these issues, and uh, which is on our which is on our website. It's much more in detail, and and some of them do cover this. But you know, our our uh, uh, approach to this was not to sort of technically look at that micro level as to let's say uh, if if oil sanctions are put and 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 they are not enforced fully or partially what difference does it make to the Iranian economy it perhaps does to some extent but rather overall look at at you know the ways in which uh, 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 the, the 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 very imposition of these sanctions basically shapes Iranian behavior policy uh, going forward uh, in reality, um, you know, we did, we haven't found there's much, much difference. I mean, for instance, uh, since uh, May of last year, the U.S. has de decided uh, uh, in exchange for Iran not enriching uh, more than it has been, uh, uh, that it would basically uh, not enforce certain oil sanctions and allow Iran to sell more oil. But, you know, that's several hundred thousand barrels more oil that Iran has been selling since summer of 2022 really doesn't materially change the the, the way in which the, the whole uh, oil sanction structure basically uh, has has changed Iran's economy and has changed the, I, Iran's state. So, um, yes, I think at some micro level, it may matter if you're looking at specific data per year of, you know, Iran's uh, inflation availability uh, of certain goods, scarcity, et cetera. But, but in terms of the overall way in which it's shaped state and society, uh, I, I don't think, you know, the, 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 the impact of the sanctions are fairly even. If I can just add a, a, a point to that, which is to say one of the things that we, we look at quite a bit in the book is um, in parallel to create, what are sanctions? They're just like words on a paper, right? At the, at the outset. Um, in order to implement sanctions, you have to, the, the, the sanctioneering state has to create a discursive reality which makes that sanctions country one that you that it becomes like radioactive in a way right so richard nephew who is one of the sanctions architects both under the bush 2 administration and the obama administration wrote in his book the art of sanctions that you had to make iran special not but not in a good way so in tandem with, with, with the creation of sanctions is also a parallel sort of discursive um, media war that we see that begins to paint, whether it's Iran or Russia or wherever else, as a place that becomes uh, uh, dangerous to even approach to do sanctions. So then in answer to this question, you know, when you levy on extra sanctions or if it's sanctions against a particular industry and not the other, the net effect, as Vali is saying, ends up becoming the same because uh, no company in their right mind who now, because again, sanctions have increased by 900%, US sanctions have increased by 900% over the past 24 years, 
in major companies and banks around the world, you now have compliance officers. And those compliance officers are in no way in, in any of their right minds. They would lose their jobs instantly if they were to say, okay, well, this particular trade with Iran is probably okay with these sanctions. So we can squeeze this one by and it's not violating the other ones. That's just not how, in reality, that's not how it works. So what this means is that this is why I was saying targeted sanctions, even in a place like South Sudan, end up in practice being like comprehensive sanctions because no company, no bank wants to risk losing access to the U.S. market by engaging in trade with these sanctioned countries. I'll just give one anecdote. You know, Iranian New Year's coming up. If you were to send anybody money on Venmo and put in your subject, this is for Iranian New Year, I guarantee you your account is going to get blocked automatically. Actually, that's a very good segue to the question that Professor Amin is asking about the impact of sanctions actually on the Iranian diaspora. So just thinking about the impact, what he calls the transnational experience compared to the local experience. I think you guys already started unpacking that, but the effects it seems goes beyond what's happening inside Iran. So if you can speak a bit more I mean, we who work on Iran know that there's the sanctions have basically made it impossible to do even like basic kinds of research um, when it comes to Iran. But I was wondering if you guys can talk a bit more about the transnational impact of it. I mean, again, you know, we can go by anecdotes. I mean, every uh, uh, you have uh, many Iranians in Canada, in U.S., in Australia, et cetera, have relatives in Iran, whether they like the Islamic Republic or not. They want to be able to help their families, particularly since the economic situation in Iran is so dire, but it's not possible to do that, uh, large, largely because there's absolutely no bank that that would transfer money to Iran or or that you would yourself be in jeopardy if uh, you send money without an OFAC license. On the other hand, for instance, under U.S. law, if you inherit property in Iran and you want to bring the money to the United States, you're allowed to, except no bank will actually bring your money. No, you you cannot. You would have to pay extraordinary amount of money, basically, to launder your your inheritance money to to come back to the United States. So, uh, you know, the more the more and more you close out a country, the more and more uh, it's it's sitting outside the international system. Those Iranians who are outside, and and even though they may be hundred percent opposed to the Islamic Republic, would want to have some kind of a human level relationship with people in, in the country because they have relatives or they want to help, or even they want to do it for political activism. There's absolutely no route uh, 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 into the country. So, uh, you know, it it, it it sort of creates a disconnect, if you would. Um, and, and then it, it also has actually practical problems for, for a lot of Iranians. I mean, I know so many institutions in the United States, charitable institutions, foundations, et cetera, their accounts have been shut by their banks as, as uh, Nargis says by compliance officers because they have the title word Iran in the title of their company or in the type non non governmental organization It's a huge ordeal to argue with the bank that that you know this is not a threat to their uh, to their compliance status. Um, so in for our book we didn't do research on um, the diaspora, but um, one of the things that we do point to in the book is that uh, sanctions, as we were saying before. Um, has a parallel discursive realm to it, which turns Iran into an enemy state. And by turn, it turns Iranian society into an enemy state and into an enemy society. So that travels transnationally. So when you have Iranian students or Iranian immigrants who are attempting to migrate out of the country or come with their student visas, for example, as we saw in just the past few years, they'll get here with valid student visas, but they are looked at just like anything else out of Iran at this stage, as being a state sponsor of terrorists, as being someone who is coming from a terrorist country. And we've had instances over instances of, of Iranian students on valid visas who are getting turned away at the border and being sent back to the country. 
And it's almost impossible to, to argue with these things in court. The other thing that happens is, for example, Iranian researchers within the country have a very difficult time getting their research published outside, even though there are general licenses in place to, to allow for scientific research, for example, to be published. But because of the way sanctions regulations are written, which is very, very vague, if, if you've ever come up against attempting to understand it, it's very vague and it's... I argue very vague on purpose, actually. So over compliance becomes something that is sort of par for the course when you are dealing with sanctions. So if those of you who remember in the early 2000s, um, there were a lot of publishing houses that did not want to publish translations from Iran. And there had Penn America had to take up a legal case against them in order to be able to do this. When I myself was attempting to do research in Iran, I had to get extra lawyers. The university had to get extra lawyers for us to go up against OFAC in order to allow a researcher to go in, even though it is allowed. But it, it we had to make an extra case, again, because compliance officers and legal counsels within universities become scared. I just had some... Um, and graduate students in the United States contacted me the other week and saying that their universities don't want to allow their doctoral research to happen. They're not traveling to Iran. They're just attempting to interview via Zoom or via like a virtual application to interview folks inside of Iran. And the universities are over complying with sanctions regulations, saying that you cannot even virtually do so. So again, these are the ways in which sanctions sort of have ripple effects, they don't stay within the nation state of the country. They do have these transnational ripple effects, as Professor Amin is pointing out. Um, our time is slowly running out, so I thought we would um, shift to maybe a more solution-based uh, conversation. Um, and so the question, this question is coming from um, Professor Seymour. Who says, okay, so san for sanctions to be an effective diplomatic tool, the US needs to demonstrate that sanctions will be lifted in exchange for changes in behavior. So, in this particular case, what can the US do to increase the credibility of its promises to lift sanctions in exchange for um, change in behavior in Iran? Uh, I mean, it's not a, it's not an, uh, it's not an easy answer, but 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 the reality, let's say this last round of talks, uh, even if we genuinely believe that both sides wanted to sign, it really came down to can the United States uh, verify that it will lift sanctions in a particular timely way? And uh, can, can the United States verify that the sanctions that are lifted won't come back? And currently, uh, any no U.S. administration can do so. And so, um, or, or either for political reasons or for legal reasons, uh, because of you know Congress has has a, has a role, et cetera. So some of that ultimately has to change. You know, there has to be a a change in the relative powers of the executive versus uh, Congress, the, the ability of Congress basically to conduct independent foreign policy. You know, Congress cannot on itself on its own uh, order war. Congress on its own cannot take the United States to war, but the Congress on its on its own can take the United States into economic war, and it can prevent an economic peace, if you will. And so that's really more about uh, uh, the, 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 ba the balance of power in the United States, and it really goes to that point that, uh, that um, uh, Nargis raised earlier to, uh, to Professor Abrahamian's question of going from embargo to sanctions. I think one difference is that embargoes and blockades were things that the U.S. president can order and disorder. So you would send your navy to block a block a port, and then you could order the navy to go. But sanctions became legal; they became a, a, a became U.S. law, and you, and and that basically is not something that's entire, entirely in the hands of the U.S. president. So every time countries now are asking for these kinds of verifications or guarantees from the U.S. They are arriving essentially uh, at a balance of power between the, the executive versus the legislature. And, and so, uh, uh, so so I think unless the U.S. finds a mechanism to change that, uh, the, the, the way in which the other countries, the, uh, the, uh, the sanctioned country sees it won't change. Now, you can look at our dysfunctional politics now and say, you know, that's definitely not going to happen with a Democratic president and a Republican Congress or that Congress is not going to give that up easily. 
so that means that basically uh, we are stuck, if you would, with, with the limitations of sanctions. And as we are sanctioning more and more and more countries, this immer, immer maneuverability of sanctions, uh, the, the fact that once they're imposed, they're very, very easy to maneuver uh, backwards, uh, is going to become a problem for U.S. foreign policy. I mean, Iran is really the canary in the, if you want to call it, in the coal mine of this issue. The bigger issue will be Russia, and then it'll be China, and then it'll be a collectivity of countries around the world, which basically come to have a certain theory of the case with U.S. sanctions uh, and, and the fact that they're not going to be lifted. And, and they basically are going to collaborate around de-dollarizing the world economy, creating alternative trade routes, blocking the United States. So it's going to become a bigger issue for American foreign policy. Nagus concluding thoughts on this question or any other question? No, I mean, one of the, we don't write this in the book, but Vani and I have spoken about it elsewhere, um, is that it's something that we have to, you know, even if you don't care about Iran at all, I think the reality is, is that sanctions are here to stay. And so we have to really understand them. And part of the problem is, is that sanctions, because they are so abstract, because they're written by lawyers and, and bankers, because they sort of, feel like we're doing something over there, but it causes all of these repercussions and we have to understand those. It's a major tool of foreign policy today. It's something that we have to begin to have a language around so that, and this is part of the reason we wrote the book is that we need to begin to start a broader conversation and debate about sanctions. Um, and that's what we're hoping to do. Um, and that one of the things I think we have to consider is that uh, because of the stickiness of sanctions, it's not going away anytime soon. So it's it's incumbent upon all of us to understand it more fully and to really get into um, uh, having a debate about it. Well, um, thank you both. And again, I wanna thank you and your co-authors for writing this book. I, it, the clarity with which this very argument is so strongly made is part of the power um, of the book that you put out. So thank you for that. Thank you for this conversation. I also want to thank the Crown Center research team for putting the seminar together, particularly Ramya Rusuk and Karen Spira, who just make this all happen. Um, I also want to remind everyone that the last Crown Center seminar is on April 3rd. Same thing, webinar at 11 a.m. And it's with uh, Professor Lisa Wedin, who will be in conversation with Dr. Daniel Neep on whether the Syrian case can provide insights into American authoritarianism. I promise you it will be a fascinating conversation and I invite everyone to come back. And with that, thank you very much. And if I didn't get to your questions, I will hand it to our panelists um, when this is over. Have a wonderful day and thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us.